Ivory Coast, West Africa, a country on the brink. Rebels have taken the north. The government's been calling on young men to join the army. In the last few days, the fighting has been escalating, and the government says they're now fighting on too many fronts. They need more soldiers. Potentially, this is a high-risk strategy, putting weapons into the hands of these young men. We followed them to the recruitment center. Peace talks were at a critical stage, but all the preparations had been for war. Thousands had gathered to sign up. They were angry, fired up to fight the rebels. We became their target. They blamed foreigners for arming the rebels and accused the foreign press of supporting them. Shit. They're running after us. No, no, no. Ivorians have always felt a cut above their African neighbors. They've opened up their economy, they've courted investors, but their dream of wealth is evaporating. Everyone has someone to blame. Hey! 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 Police! We called on the police for help. Instead, they arrested us and took our camera. We left it running. Where are they taking us in? No one's proud of what's happening here. On la télévision anglaise. After three hours, the police released us. We raced through the streets of Abidjan towards our hotel. We've got about 20 minutes now until the curfew kicks in. Uh, it's a very bad time to get a puncture. After 7 o'clock, the police have orders to shoot on site anyone who's moving around the city and considered suspicious. This guy is in serious trouble. Trouble? Oh, he's left his car. Staying out late means risking death. This city was the commercial heart of French-speaking West Africa. Its wealth grounded in the international chocolate trade and Ivory Coast cocoa plantations. Crouching in the shadows were armed police. Since September, Abidjan has been on a knife edge. When rebel soldiers took control of the north, they also tried to shoot their way to power here. We can run. Even just a few months ago, this was a city that had a thriving nightlife. There's lots and lots of nightclubs in Abidjan. Very good restaurants. It's a city that lives as much by night as it does in the day, but no longer. Next morning, the news was grim. The British we've just learned have started to advise their citizens to leave the country. They see the government army recruitment campaign as a sign that the country is moving a step further away from a political solution and a step closer, potentially, towards national disaster. Local journalists warned us if we filmed openly on the streets, we risk being beaten up. We kept the camera in the car and set off to see the editor of a leading opposition newspaper. Meite Sindhu has been outspoken about the causes of the civil war. He's paid a price for that. Last month, his offices were wrecked by pro-government thugs. So he's showing us uh, a couple of computers which were smashed. Since one-party rule ended a decade ago, Ivory Coast has been led by a succession of southern Christians. They've all manipulated voting and nationality laws to keep their northern rivals from power. So when a group of disaffected northern soldiers attempted a coup last September, the country was ripe to split in two. Meite condemned the rebels' methods, but said the government had a lot to answer for. 
Yeah. He's okay. saying that since uh, uh, President Bagbo's election, uh, th th there have been an enormous number of abuses. People have persecuted the uh, gendarmerie, uh, persecutes people. People are arbitrarily put in prison, uh, uh, arbitrarily executed also. Uh, but none of this has been punished. Uh, there's an atmosphere of total impunity. Among those with the most to fear are immigrants. They make up a third of the 16 million people in Ivory Coast. Many have been here for three generations. Regardless, they're now labelled foreigners. We headed for a shanty town where immigrants from the neighbouring countries Mali and Burkina Faso live. Scattered all over Abidjan, there are little communities of Malian and Burkinabe immigrants who live in what's called, they call them quartiers precaires, uh, precarious neighbourhoods. You can see why. Scenes like this have become dangerous to film, but from a hiding place we recorded all that remained of a nearby immigrant community. Security forces had driven off its inhabitants and bulldozed it. The rebels in the north are mainly Muslim. Muslims in the south are paying the price. We found one man whose shack had been destroyed, living in a cupboard at the home of his employer. He daren't show his face. He's saying that they started by coming to the neighborhood, knocking on the door in the middle of the night, and uh, asking, asking for money, asking for his, um, his permit to, to reside here. When he didn't have any money, then they started taking things in the neighborhood. That's how it all began. Around two-thirds of Ivory Coast's population is under 30, many without jobs or prospects. One man has tuned into their grievances, Charles Blay Goudet. To find Blay Goudet, we went to a bar used by supporters of his youth movement. At the click of his fingers, Blay Goudet can bring thousands onto the streets in support of the government. Whatever its faults, they said Ivory Coast did have a form of democracy. To them, the rebels were a coalition of Muslim immigrants and ambitious northerners, funded by sinister multinationals. One of the men agreed to help me. So he's going to come and find us at, uh, tomorrow morning uh, at around 8 o'clock to uh, take us in to uh, meet Charles Blake Goudet, hopefully. He's here. Goudet is emerging as a key figure in the government's campaign to quash the rebellion. Some people call you the general, don't they? Yeah. They do? Yeah. He dismisses any notion the rebels are fighting for the rights of the mainly Muslim North. To him, they're a bunch of renegade soldiers, backed by foreigners, and whose sole aim is to grab power. He was about to address a recruitment rally for the army. He said we could come. Huh? What are you planning to tell the young men today? I'm planning to tell them that when the country is living such a you know, situation, the young people have to play an important role. They have to fight for their country. Are you not uh, afraid that a lot of your countrymen are going to die? They are dying already. Since the 19th of September, they are dying. As we approached the rally, we saw a breakaway crowd. Blay Goudet asked the driver to stop. He wanted to find out what was going on. They began to chant Blay Goudet's name. To Abidjan's disaffected pro-government youth, he's a hero. It turned out the recruitment station had been overwhelmed. These men had been turned away. Blay Goudet reassured them their chance would come. Are you 
you confident that there's time and the means to train these boys properly before they get sent to combat? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. For all Blake Goudet's nonchalance, it was clear we were heading into a volatile situation. We stopped and he sent one of his men, Narcisse, to pick up an armed guard. Blake Goudet is not a member of the government, but he acts as though he is. The strength of his youth movement has given him a direct line to the president. Have we arrived? Yes. Thousands of men had turned up to join the army. Many were Blay Goudet's followers. His critics see in them the makings of an ethnic militia. The crowd was angry. They'd seen Blay Goudet on television calling for recruits, but there were more than the army could cope with. Blay Goudet got out to calm them. His gunmen followed, and suddenly we were left alone. For many of these men, the army was their first chance to earn a wage. Ivory Coast has followed most of the rules laid down in the West that are supposed to make economies grow. But these men remain poor and desperate. They feel the rules are stacked against them and their anger turned on us. Close your window. We had to get out of there. We drove through the crowd, scattering them. We made our escape the wrong way down a dual carriageway. We needed to track down Blake Goudet. Our friend Narcisse is trying to get back in touch with him. We picked up another gunman. Here we go again. Blake Goudet met us just outside the recruitment camp. We hid the camera and he got us inside. We filmed from behind the car. Even in here, the army could barely control the situation. Shit, they're whipping people. If you take poverty and disaffection, weak political structures, and then stir in ethnic and religious differences, this is the kind of explosive melee you get. Outside, hundreds still clamoured to get in. We were beginning to attract attention. It'll be a relief when we're able to leave this particular scene. We're waiting for the crowd outside the gate to clear before we can get out of it. We had to conceal the camera again, and with Blay Goudet's help, we made it out. What about the ethnic content of the army? Is there not a danger that um, recruiting at a time like this, when passions are so high, you, you basically uh, create an army that's dominated by people from the south going to fight a movement, a rebel movement from the north? No, but They're not knows. splitting the country yes. further? But, yeah, but since this crisis, there's no problem with our, our army. There's no problem, you know, between soldiers coming from the north or against dawn, those coming from the south or those coming from the east but or were the there, west. There weren't no many problem. people from the north in that crowd. Yeah, but they are not from our army. This is the problem. The, the, the he insisted he wasn't exploiting the country's divisions. It was the rebels who were doing that. But it would be a brave Muslim who attended a Blay Goudet rally. There is no problem of ethnic in our army. There is no problem. We're setting off north today, up towards rebel-held territory, hoping to be able to cross the front line into the town of Boaké, which is rebel headquarters. 
Normally it should be a journey of about four hours, but people say that the roadblocks that are on the en route are likely to delay us a bit. There was barely a car on the road. This country has by far the best road network in the whole region, and usually this would be one of the busiest trade routes in Ireland of West Africa. 50 miles out, we reached an area where cocoa is grown. Nearly half the world's crop comes from this country. Economic crisis has created the conditions for civil war. Cocoa and Ivory Coast dependence on it has played a role in that. These are the cocoa pods that have just been harvested. The government used to buy and sell the whole cocoa crop. Four years ago, they stopped under pressure from the World Bank, which argued the state was taking too much of the profits. Okay. But the farmers were left at the mercy of international markets. The price of cocoa fell. Millions of people saw their incomes plummet. Now these villagers fear war. A few hours later, we began to run into government checkpoints. We were closing on the front line. So far on this journey, we've sped through five or six roadblocks. On each occasion, we've left behind hundreds of Ivorians waiting to be frisked. Our luck held. Near the city of Yamasukru, we encountered a patrol of French peacekeepers heading for the front line. We tagged along. At the government's request, troops from the old colonial power are holding the two sides apart. They stopped near Yamasukru's Basilica. It was built by the government in the 80s, a reminder of Christian dominance. Eventually, we reached an area under French control. It's too risky to go to Boaké now because it's nearly nightfall, so we're going to stay nearby in Yamasukru for the night. In the morning, we entered the no-man's land that separates the front lines. The road is just beginning to get a bit spooky now. The villages we've been passing are increasingly deserted and most of the only traffic we're seeing is military. We're actually coming up to an area where there was some very heavy fighting at the beginning of this crisis. Nearly a million people have been displaced by this war and thousands killed. We turned a corner and saw the rebels. While our papers were checked, I went over to talk to two rebel fighters. They said the government had made them foreigners in their own land. We've talked about it enough. It's been enough dialogue. It's with force now that we're going to resolve it. They let us pass. Rebel held Boaké, the country's second city, mainly Muslim. Weeks before, it had been a battlefield. Many local Christians fled. We searched for Sheriff Usman, the local rebel commander controlling the city. He was once a sergeant in the Ivorian army. Okay, he's saying uh, he's a soldier and today he's fighting for his identity. He's saying that even if they have to fight their helicopters and their, their tanks with pebble, uh, with stones and, uh, and, and knives, they will do so and win. 
He's saying because they're fighting for their identity and to become Eve, Eve Warrior. The fuel's running out, the local economy's collapsed, but most people seem to identify with the rebel cause despite the hardship. The problem is they, they, uh, they can't get any money. Because the banks are shut. And a lot of the big traders have also shut their shops. Rebel curfew approached. People are trapped here. The rebels have been saying they won't disarm until the government scraps identity laws that make it difficult for northerners to vote. Next morning, we prepared to start filming. Rebel gunmen told us to follow them. We sped through the city in convoy. entering what appears to uh, have formerly been a school where which has been taken over by the rebels in fact all the schools in Boaké have been shut since the rebellion started suddenly there was Tuo Fosier the military commander of the rebels a man who helped plot the revolt from exile in Burkina Faso we'd asked to meet him the rebels had obliged I asked him about the scenes we'd witnessed in Abidjan. He's saying that he does have a message for the young recruits and the sooner they hear it, the better. He pointed out that when the government tried to retake Boaké, they were repulsed with heavy losses. He's saying that the solution isn't to then now send uh, boys from the street. The solution is round the negotiating table. He's saying that the solution is for, the, uh, for there to be an ivory coast for everybody uh, and for there to be real democracy and transparent elections. Ivory Coast was one of Africa's greatest hopes. By fostering division amidst economic gloom, its leaders have set the scene for its disintegration. Attempts to broker peace continue, but for now, Ivorians are doing what many others are doing across the globe, withdrawing into identities that seem to offer security in a hostile world, but end up fueling war. He's saying that he went to school with people who are from Mali, from Burkina Faso, from Ghana, from France. Now they're no longer friends. He feels ill at ease. Moi, en tant que musicien, ma seule chance, c'est de véhiculer. Je n'ai pas d'armes pour pouvoir tuer des gens en Côte d'Ivoire. Je n'ai que ma guitare et ma voix pour transmettre au moins le message de cette fraternité, de cette paix, de cette liberté. He says he, he doesn't have a weapon to, to get his message across. He's just got his, his guitar to try and put across this message of brotherhood and friendship. Mon pays est en tant que Neva. The, what about the 